Sure, perfect. Um, I'm a master gardener, I'm a writer. I'm now on what's my eighth book. <laughs> We're working on two manuscripts um, right now. Um, so the eighth book in a series of gardening books um, that are sort of uh, geared for prairie gardening, for Alberta and prairie gardening. So yeah, so it's been very busy the last couple of years. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I'm going to get started with caring for your plants um, over the summer. Um, so and sort of uh, we're going to tackle it from the perspective of um, trying to deal with drought and heat stress because I think this summer is going to be another hot one and that's supposedly what they're saying um, right now. I mean, it feels like it's a little bit cooling here in Calgary, but I mean, I'm not sure what the rest of the provinces. Um, I know they have no rain down south. Um, I know they've gotten quite a bit of rain up north, so it's sort of a mixed bag across the province. But I know that we're kind of concerned about heat and we're concerned about water right now. So um, definitely something to think about as we approach um, the summer months and looking after our gardens that we've just planted or we're maybe in the process of planting. I know I still don't have my tomatoes out yet. <laughs> I was hoping by the start. <laughs> but yeah, soon. I think this week. So this weekend, I think I'll be able to get them out. So, um, so we've got everything planted. Um, what are you going to do to keep everything alive and thriving? Um, so um, I know with school gardens, it's a little bit of a challenge um, because quite often the students aren't there, um, or if they are, they're coming in on sort of a volunteer basis with maybe parents or support staff, that kind of thing, people coming in and sort of periodically peeking in in the garden over the summer. Um, they're not necessarily there the entire time. Um, I guess they'll be there through the month of June, so that's a good thing. So hopefully you've got some stuff that you can harvest um, before then, maybe rhubarb, um, your radishes, some of your leafy greens, that kind of thing you're going to be able to do now um, in the next month or so. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about applies strictly to vegetables and fruit. Um, but I'm going to talk about flowers too, because I mean, we've got all kinds of flowers growing in our, in our school gardens as well. Um, so this is sort of a, the, what I'm going to talk about is going to encompass all of those things. So. So I think we'll talk about watering first. Um, it's a really big topic. Um, it takes time to do, to water your garden properly. Um, it, it's, you have to strike the balance between giving your plants too much water and not giving them enough. Um, you have to be very, very careful. Overwatering can cause rot and mold and all kinds of issues, powdery mildew, that kind of thing. Um, underwatering, of course, you're looking at drought stress. So um, your plants aren't gonna make it with that. Um, a lot of plants don't taste very well if you haven't given them enough water. Um, so if you've got a drip irrigation system, which some, some uh, school gardens might have, maybe in your greenhouse perhaps, or outside in some of your beds if you're lucky, um, some of your raised beds might have them. And they're actually not that hard to install. So they're kind of a nice idea when you're not there all the time <laughs> because you can set them up on timers. Um, so you can kind of let them do their thing. Um, so while the crops are growing, you can let the drip irrigation system work. Um, just make sure you check um, to make sure that there's no soil clogging the emitters. So maybe check them a few every few weeks. Just make sure that there's no soil clogging them. Um, also make sure that there's no, no major leaks going on anywhere in the system or that your water pressure has changed for some reason. Look into all of those things periodically. Just make sure that, that it's running smoothly. Otherwise, that is an amazing system. <laughs> if, you can, if, if it's affordable and it works, it's a really, really nice thing to do when you're not there all the time. Um, also, you're not watering great big globs of water all the time. You're giving just a little tiny bit um, over a lengthy period of time. So your plants are getting what they need right where they need it at the root system. So um, it, they're great. They're really, really good. If you don't have that, you've got to go out and water by hand. So you either you're watering with a watering can, you're watering with a garden hose, um, you're taking water from a tap um, connected to a building, or you're taking water from um, a rain barrel, perhaps. Um, you can, you just make sure you go slowly, make sure you go water deeply. Um, most plants, the rule is an inch of water a week. Um, there's a bunch of factors that influence that though. I mean, you gotta look at the temperature. Um, <laughs> so if we have a summer like we did last year and you're, you're going to need to water a few more times than that. Um, it, it's, it's just, I know last year, I think I spent hours a day <laughs> watering. It felt like it anyway. So yeah, absolutely. You're going to need to look at that. You're gonna need to look at your soil conditions. If your soil is, um, if it's not as healthy as it should be, for example, it doesn't have enough organic matter in it, um, like compost, that kind of thing. Um, it's not going to take up water properly. It's not going to hold water as well as it should. And then you're gonna have issues. So you're gonna probably need to water more um, or 
if your soil is heavy clay, that's the opposite. Water's gonna pool on top. You're going to need to add some organic matter to get that water to get down to the plant roots. So there's, there's different ways of looking at it. Your soil condition is a big, big factor in that. Um, the types of plants you're growing is also, that's also a factor. Um, some plants need a lot of water, some don't. Um, so definitely um, your plant labels, your, um, your seed packages, that kind of thing is going to give you that information. So take a look at that. Um, you can you save those. I always save my seed packages. <laughs> I always save my labels um, because then you can use it as reference. You can also look online for all of these things too. So definitely do a little bit of research and see sort of what your plants um, needs are. Um, and group your plants together when you plant them. Group them so that they all have the same water needs, the ones that are like you put them in a, in a certain spot, the ones that all have the same watering needs. Makes it easier when you go to water. So yeah. Um, don't just spray the hose around for a few minutes and then walk away and put it away. Um, you need to actually get down there and get down to the base of the plants and water. Um, so this can take a long time. <laughs> It's depending on how big the garden is. Um, so yeah, and same with the watering can. Get get right down there. Um, look at the plants while you're doing it. Um, you know, sort of get get multiple hands. Get the students involved. Get them all with a watering can. Get them all in there and get them watering. Um, you need to go deeply, and you don't want to. If the deeper you go, the less often you have to water because those plant roots are going to be stronger. Um, they're not going to be all sitting up at the surface like they would if you just watered. In free, like if you water frequently, but just a small amount of water, those roots aren't going to grow deep and beautifully. They're going to just stay up at the top of the surface. So definitely encourage those roots to go deep and go down and look for water. So water deeply. Um, there's a really simple trick to know when you have to water. Um, you can take your garden trowel, just your regular hand trowel that you're using for your garden. Sink it in the soil up to the, you sink the whole blade into the soil. So up to the handle um, and then pull it out take a look at it if it's got soil clinging to it like damp bits of soil clinging to it you probably don't have to water you can wait a couple days um, but if it's all like if it comes out clean or it's all dry definitely give it a water it's a real simple trick and you can do that even in containers in containers you might not want to use a trowel you might want to just use your finger um, so then you just sink your finger up to the second knuckle or to the knuckle and just go deep down test it out that way. Um, a trial might be a little too big depending on your <laughs> container. So yeah, um, those are really, really good tips. Make sure you're watering, um, you know, deeply. That really, really hot weather, get in there and, and do it, um, you know, really, really well. Don't, don't skimp on the water. Um, you'll find actually too, if you, if you water deeply and infrequently, so not as often, you probably won't waste as much water either. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a water saving tip. Um, and if you have trees and shrubs, you might be tempted to haul out the sprinkler system. Um, I don't usually recommend that. Um, because what will happen is the water gets sprayed up and, and hits the, the leaves. If you've got some kind of there's fungal spores, um, they can be transferred um, if you spray the water up into a tree. So make sure you, you water them at the base of the tree or shrub. So yeah, definitely that's that's a good idea just to sort of not um, spread around uh, pathogens. It's just a really good good thing to do. It's just a safe thing to do. Um, also, if you've got um, if you're growing a plant like rhubarb. Uh, Rhubarb is a really good example because it's got it's got the stalks coming in from a central base, um, and it's a popular plant that people grow. They grow it in school gardens. They grow it all over. Um, so when you're watering, you don't want to actually water into that center of the plant. Um, that will actually cause rot. So water sort of around the edges of the rhubarb, like at the base, but not into the crown of the plant, into the base of the plant in the center. Um, it's just not a good idea. So definitely watch with plants like that where, where they come from the central rosette sort of in the center. Um, that's a good thing to do too. Um, when to water. Watering in the morning is the very best thing you can do. I mean, uh, the old, you know, definitely water when you can. <laughs> if you're scrambling for time, water when you can, when you have to, when you're able to. But water in the morning is actually the best. Um, it, it uh, prevents the evaporation later in the day when it's really, really hot. 
Um, so in the heat of the day, you're going to water and a lot of that water is going to evaporate right away. It's just, it's, it's a waste. It's a waste of water. So definitely do it in the morning. Um, if you're watering with the garden hose as well, I find sometimes if you leave the garden hose sort of laying <laughs> in the, on the ground and it's hot in the summertime, you've got a little bit of water left in there, that water gets really, really hot. That's not good for the plants. So definitely um, if you don't um, put away your garden hoses or you've got them in a spot or you know, that were hot, um, water in the morning so it's a little bit cooler so the temperatures are cooler it's also nicer for you I mean seriously <laughs> it's just more comfortable so um watering is the key to good flavor and good texture with fruits and veggies with a lot of them um tomatoes if you water inconsistently if you don't water on a regular basis and you don't water enough or if you go from swings of watering too much to watering too little um tomatoes will crack open the fruit will crack open um with that kind of behavior so water regularly water consistently water deeply um blossom end rot is, is another problem um and that can happen if you water inconsistently as well that's um you probably see that that's when the tomatoes get that sort of soft blackened rotten kind of mushy spot <laughs> on the blossom end um, can be prevented with regular watering um consistent regular watering um, um, radishes, they turn in flavorless if you don't water them regularly. Um, so definitely they're really good roots. So you might not have the most flavorful carrots if you don't water on a regular basis. Lettuce gets bitter. I hate it when it gets It definitely needs a regular, regular consistent, um, though that can handle a little bit of drier conditions um, it just means that you can go a few extra days before they absolutely need to be watered so beans are one example so both pole beans bush beans um, runner beans if you're growing beans they can tolerate a little bit of extra dryness um, corn is another one and you're looking at peppers as well as being another one that can handle a little bit of drought but definitely water them when they get when they need it um, they can just go for a little bit longer. Um, if you've got wicking beds or you use wicking containers, um, global buckets are one example of wicking containers that are quite often used in schools. Um, I think there's another one called earth boxes. Those are also used in schools quite often. Um, test the soil first before you water. Um, those reservoirs can actually hold quite a bit of water, so you might not need to water right away. Um, they are a really good system in a school because you don't have to look after them. Um, they don't, they're not really high maintenance. You don't have to look after them as, as frequently as you do with some other systems. So, um, And I mentioned it in the last workshop, but I'll just mention them again. There is a, an old sort of a traditional method of watering called an Oya. Um, they're like a little uh, clay pot or container, a vase basically, that is that are sunk into the soil. Um, so you, you water them from the top and then the water wicks out into the soil as the soil needs it um, through the porous clay that they're made of. Um, you can make um, do it yourself once um, out of terracotta pots. I'll put up a link um, in the Alberta School Garden Facebook group. I've done, I did it the last time, but I'll put, I'll refresh it just so you can see how to make those because they're really fun to do. Students love making these; they're really easy. So, and they're really great in containers. Um, if you've got a large container, these are fabulous. So, there is also one that can be done with um, recycled pop bottles or water bottles. Um, so that's another easy one that really, really works as well. So if you've got a few days where you're not going to be at the garden. Those are all good solutions that you can use to sort of stretch that water. Um, so next thing we have to talk about is fertilizer. Um, I don't really use a lot of fertilizer in my garden. I make sure that my soil is ready to go before I plant. Um, so if you've prepared your garden beds and your containers properly in the spring, um, so you've added your compost, you've added your kelp meal, you've added your fish fertilizer, whatever it is that you're going to put into your soil at the start of the season, to condition it and to fertilize it, um, give give um, nutrients to plants. You shouldn't really need to add too too much um, over the season. Um, tomatoes are really heavy feeders. There's a few other plants that are, um, but tomatoes are definitely probably top of, of mind. Um, so they need a little bit of extra. So you can give them a little bit of vermicompost or a little bit of compost um, about once a month through the growing season. Um, so you can just sprinkle that around the plants. It depends on how many plants you have, how much you apply. Um, you usually only want to go a couple 
couple teaspoons or tablespoons. And like I said, you don't need to dig it in. Just sprinkle it around as you water. That will percolate down through the soil and the plants will be able to take it up through the roots. Um, if you're okay with using granular or liquid synthetic fertilizers, you can mix them up according to the package and instructions and use them. Um, there's plenty of good tomato fertilizers out there that you can use. Um, the benefit with those is that they're not slow release, they're quick. Um, so the plants take them up really, really rapidly and use those nutrients um, right away. Um, so it just depends on what, what we want to go with that. Um, um, so I'm talking either perennial vegetables or perennial over the season, just around the base of the trees or the shrubs um, or your perennials. And that's probably about all you have to do. Um, you don't really have to work a whole lot with those. So that, that's kind of nice too, because that means you can sort of set it up and forget about it. Um, the, like I said, the only things that you really got to worry about are some of the really heavy feeders like tomatoes, peppers, those kinds of things. Squash, um, they need a little bit of extra fertilizer through the season to give you those big, beautiful fruits. Um, mulching. A mulch, it's got to be one of the best things you can do for the garden, especially when we're talking about drought and heat conditions. Um, they definitely, it, it helps immensely. So if you put a layer of clean straw, um, around the base of your plants, your vegetables, um, in your vegetable garden, you're looking at about a one to two inch layer, no more than that. You don't want it to like, <laughs> you don't want big piles of mulch, um, but definitely a one or, one or two inch layer. Um, it keeps the moisture near the soil surface. It also helps regulate the temperature of the soil. Um, so you're, it also covers the soil too. So you get the benefit that you're not probably going to have as many weeds, or if you do have weeds, you can pull them up easily. Um, but it's the, the moisture retention and the soil temperature. Those are the two huge benefits when you're talking about drought or stress, uh, heat stress conditions. So yeah, definitely use mulch, absolutely. If you don't have straw, and straw I hear is very hard to get right now. <laughs> so if you don't have straw, you can use um, grass clippings. If you've got them, like if you've mowed your lawn, you can dry them, dry out the glass, grass clippings, just throw them on the driveway for a few minutes, um, like an hour or two, dry them out, then throw them in your garden. Um, you can put um, dried leaves if you have any. Um, that's a little bit harder at this time of year, but that is an option. Um, even shredded newspaper will work. Um, it will blow away, so keep it wet, <laughs> but uh, it will work. Um, I do know some gardeners who use, if you've got um, sort of a budget to do that with, you can use strips of burlap that you can cut and then just place in between the rows. It works really well as um, you can just tack it down with um, landscape pegs. Um, that works as well. And you can leave those in place all year round. And then at the end of the season, you can wash them and then you can um, reuse them next year. So those are all good, good, uh, good things to try. If you're growing trees and shrubs, like you've got fruit trees or shrubs, use wood chips, bark mulch, that kind of thing, a little bit of a chunkier, um, bigger mulch. You can definitely go with that in those beds. Um, perennial beds as well, you can use that too. Um, like so for perennial flowers or, or vegetables. Um, although I probably use straw for perennial vegetables <laughs> just because I just like the looks of it and it just, it works really, really well. So, um, be careful not to pile the mulch right up against the plants. Um, you want it to be pulled back just a few centimeters. Um, it helps the plant stems from rotting. If you've got the mulch pushed up right up against the plant stems, all that moisture and stuff like that might, might make the plant stems rot. So just pull it back just a little tiny bit and you're good to go. Um, Weeding is another thing. Um, we don't like doing it. It's the worst task of gardening. I hate weeding, um, <laughs> but you have to, sadly. Um, the reason why you do is so that the plants that, are, that you want to thrive in your garden do. Um, you don't want those weeds competing with, with your, your garden plants um, because they will. They'll take over. They'll They'll grow their roots everywhere. They'll spread all over the place. They'll take up space that your plants need, all of that. Um, some weeds are considered noxious or prohibited noxious um, in the Alberta Weed Control Act. So you do need to control those ones. You need to either remove them 
uh, well, you need to remove them, but some of them you need to remove permanently. Some of them you can sort of wait a little bit and then pull them out. You've got to get rid of them at any rate. So um, take a look at that document. Um, I'll put a link up to that up for that as well. Um, just so that you can see there is, um, we have a very good, um, uh, there's a very good round of fact sheets produced by the Alberta Invasive Species Council. Um, so you can take a look at those as well and sort of ID the weeds in your garden and um, yeah, you can match them up and get rid of them um, if they're on the list. Um, the thing is with weeds too, is that they compete for nutrients, they compete for light, um, they compete for water. When you're looking at um, the fact that we're, we're worrying about water in, in a very hot summer, you don't want weeds taking all the water. <laughs> so definitely remove them, um, it's just necessary. It is a daunting task though, however, because they seem to pop up overnight, like hundreds and hundreds of them. So just try to tackle them a little bit at a time daily. Um, it's a great project for students to go out and try to ID plants. Um, yes, they're IDing weeds, but it's a really, really good way of getting them out and learning a little bit of um, the different parts of plants um, and what to look at um, as far as things like are these leaves lobed, um, you know, that kind of thing. Look at, look at all the different ways, look at the flower, the ID flowers, that kind of thing. So it is, it is an exercise. You can, you can make it into an exercise. So. Um, covering your plants. I know um, I live in Calgary, so um, we kind of get a lot of hail here. And I know in central Alberta, hail is a huge thing. Um, so um, you can get hail covers, um, actual netting um, that you can purchase. It's a type of um, mesh that can be purchased to use as hail covers. And you can put that over hoops, um, over top of your raised beds um, or in ground. You can use them um, uh, you know, anywhere in your garden where you've got an exposed area that could be hammered by hail. They are expensive. Um, so definitely, it, but if, if your garden is in a permanent spot, and you wish to protect it season by season, these last a really, really long time. So it might be an investment um, to think about if your garden is constantly hammered by hail. Um, there are shade cloth fabrics, which are really, really good um, in our, you know, like for hot, for heat, dealing with heat. Um, they're made of woven poly polyester. Um, they're usually green in color, um, sort of a dark green. They're a mesh weave. They're kind of plasticky feeling. Um, you can hang them over hoops um, in a raised bed or in your garden beds. Um, you can use them in your greenhouse. If you've got a greenhouse, it can keep your plants cooler. Um, some of them are rated to like 50% cooler. It just depends on, on the fabric that you're getting. Um, so yeah, um, they really do help. Um, keep your, you don't have to water as much um, and it does keep your plants a lot cooler so they're not wilting from um, you know, heat stress. So that's definitely an option. They are a little bit pricey as well, um, but I, I've noticed the prices are coming down a little bit on them and they're a little bit more um, readily available than they used to be. It used to be hard to get those kinds of fabrics, but now it seems like the garden centers are, are carrying them. So there's a little bit more of an availability on them. So in different types, different manufacturers, it's a good option. Another um, thing that can help with hail that I've used in the past um, are, um, and they also help a little bit with um, protection against insects, um, insect pests like um, cabbage moths, that kind of thing, or is row cover fabric. So that's usually, that's the white um, fabric that you see um, quite often used with raised beds. Um, it's made out of polypropylene or polyester, uh, it just depends on the type that you get. And um, yeah, you can use that over top of, um, you know, stakes, frames, um, hoops, whatever you want to do. Um, it does, the heavier weight fabric does help against a, um, a moderate hailstorm. It's not going to help if the hailstones are golf ball size, but I mean, it will help a little bit um, so that it is a good protector, protector for plants. And it, like I said, it does help um, if you've got cabbage moths going after your, um, your broccoli, your cabbages, um, your kale, that kind of thing. If you put these fabrics over top of your beds um, early in the season, it will prevent the moths from laying their eggs. So it is something that you can try. Um, it's a nice organic way of dealing with pests like that. Um, another type of um, sort of fabric, I guess, that you can use in the garden, um, especially if you're growing fruit plants, um, such as say hascap or strawberries or maybe currants, that kind of thing. Um, birds love to eat those. So definitely use some netting. 
Um, the thing with the netting though, is make sure that the mesh is really, really fine. Um, you don't want birds to hurt themselves um, by getting stuck in the, in the mesh. So um, I know some bird netting that they sell has really, really big holes in it. I would never buy that. I would never recommend that. Get something that's very small that the birds, there's no way that the birds could get through it. Um, so yeah, definitely that's something to consider if you've got issues with birds. It's a really, really good way of um, dealing with them without a lot of hassle. Um, and small plants like, like Haskell and that kind of thing, you can cover them easily with netting. So um, yeah, so that's another thing. Pollination is something else to talk about. Um, if you're using covers that I just described um, on your in-ground or uh, raised beds, you'll need to open them up um, periodically. What, unless, I should clarify, if you're going to use them for pest control for the cabbage moths, um, that kind of thing, you're not going to want to open them up because otherwise the cabbage moths are going to get in them. But for everything else, <laughs> you're going to want to open them up periodically so that pollinators can get inside and, and do their work and pollinate your plants. Um, so you're going to want your bees and stuff like that to have access. So um, if you can open up your covers for certain times during the day, that would be great. But in some cases, like I just mentioned, you're not going to be able to do that. Or, or maybe you have a greenhouse you're going to have a hard time getting pollinators in your greenhouse quite often. Um, so you're going to want to, to be able to hand pollinate. Um, so you can do that. It's, it's actually possible. So um, for tomatoes, for example, you can just give the plants a little bit of a shake. Um, when the flowers are full of pollen, it'll just dislodge the pollen and it'll sprinkle down onto other plant, other uh, flowers and they'll pollinate the flowers. Um, some people use the um, fine tipped uh, paintbrush to paint the pollen and move the pollen to from one flower to the other on the tomato plant. It works really, really well. Um, for squash, um, such as zucchini, like summer squash, such as zucchini, take a little cotton swab, swab and wipe some of the pollen off of the male flowers and transfer it to the female flowers. Now, the male flowers <laughs> have a long skinny stem on them. So that's how you tell that those are the male flowers. Female flowers, they have the undeveloped fruit growing underneath them. So if you lift up a female flower, you'll see a little round fruit under there. It's not ready to go yet, but you'll see that there. So that's the way you'll know which one is which. Um, it's just a very basic thing to remember. So, and I'll post all of that up as well so that if you do wanna hand pollinate your squash, it seems like the last few years I'm, I'm seeing in a lot of the gardening groups, people are really, really intent on hand pollinating their squash. They're not getting the results um, from bees and um, that they'd like, so they're hand pollinating to help. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a skill to know. Um, it's also kind of interesting to teach students how to do this um, so that they, you, it's a way of teaching them the plant parts, um, floral parts. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really, and how, how, what pollination is and how pollination works. Um, so I think it's a really good task. Um, plant also some flowers in your, if you're growing a vegetable garden, plant some flowers in it. Put some marigolds in there, put some calendula, borage, um, dill, those kinds of things, a bunch of different herbs, um, let them flower. Those are all really, really good attractants for bees and butterflies, which are gonna help your plants because they'll come and buzz around the, the flowers and then they'll hit your vegetables with the balloon. <laughs> so yeah, um, and then um, pests is another thing that we have to think about. Um, we don't really want to deal with them, but we kind of have to. So um, cutworms are one um, early in the season that are a huge problem. Um, so they feed at night usually, um, and uh, they're like little grub. They're just the larvae of a worm, so they're or a larvae of a moth. So they look like little grubs. Uh, they're little fat, little round things. They're ugly. Anyway, um, they can knock the plants right down to the stem in the night. Um, so you'll go in the garden in the morning and your plant will be completely decimated, right? The stem will be cut right at the soil surface. Um, you'll know that's a cutworm if it's done, if that's what you're seeing. Um, for them, you can create a collar um, to prevent them from doing that. Um, so you can just use, um, I use yogurt containers, you can use uh, sour cream containers, whatever you've got, anything you've got in the house. Cut the bottom of them, sink, put it over top of your plant, sink it into the ground a couple inches, the cutworms won't go across the barrier. Um, they, so they'll leave your plants alone. And you can just remove them when the plants get bigger. Um, you can go out at night if you want and pick the cutworms off, <laughs> but that's kind of gross. So, um, and another common one are slugs. Um, you've probably, 
everybody's probably had an experience with slug and they're disgusting. Um, so um, they also feed at night primarily. Um, I do see them sometimes in the morning when I go out into the garden very early, they'll be up eating. <laughs> at like six in the morning. So um, you can pick them off again um, and get rid of them that way. Um, there is a yeast trap that you can use. I know a lot of people go for beer, but if you're you know, a school garden, you can't exactly do that. Yeast is actually the ingredient. The yeast and the sugar are the things that you need to use. Um, that's kind of the contents of the beer that the slugs are attracted to. So you can just use yeast, sugar, and water. And um, I can put up the recipe for that in the school garden group, there's a couple, there's certain amounts that you can use to put together, throw it in a saucer, throw that in your garden in a couple places, put a couple saucers out and the slugs will be attracted to that and hopefully not to your plants. Um, and then the last thing that I need to talk about is harvesting. Um, you're not gonna harvest all of your garden at once. Um, you're gonna harvest uh, quite a few things at the end of the season. So I'm not really gonna address those ones. Uh, you're gonna harvest you know, your, your, your squashes, your, or your winter squashes, your pumpkins, those kinds of things at the end of the season. But throughout the season, you're gonna be picking things like lettuces. You're gonna be picking your radishes. Um, you're going to be uh, picking summer squash like zucchini um, and, and, and uh, pan pan squash, um, peas, beans, all of those things. Make sure you harvest when, the th when these plants are ready to go. Quite often I see that people have sort of let their peas and their beans go. Um, and honestly, it's just a matter of a couple days before <laughs> they become unpalatable. So definitely pick as often as you can or as often as you want to. Um, Eat, eat these crops, they're amazing. And that's why you're growing your garden. So share them and pick them as frequently as you can. Um, and yeah, those are the best um, tips that I can kind of give for looking after your plants for the summer.